Welcome to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. Join your hosts, Anita Russell, Mavis Bauman, and Gail Hunter, as we create a brave space for conversations about racism, personal transformation, and accountability. Conversation provides a means to dive deeply into your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs, and examine what emerges in your words, actions, and behaviors. The show is a journey towards anti-racism by cultivating change within yourself first and then out into the world. Learn to engage in racial dialogue using four tools, courage, conversation, relationship, and accountability. Discover how truth, reconciliation, and healing can emerge from honest and deliberate conversations. Manifest social change right now on Inflection Point Podcast. Well, hello, hello, and thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Inflection Point Podcast. I am your host, Anita Russell, and here's a quick hello from my co-host, Mavis and Gail. Hello, hello, I'm Mavis Bauman. Hi, and I'm Gail Hunter, and welcome. Excellent, excellent. So if you've been following us for a while, you know we always have a really, really hot topic and then some specific questions that we ponder uh, throughout the hour uh, that we're together. And today is no different. So today's topic is internalized racism. And the specific question that we're going to ponder is what is internalized racism? And how exactly is it manifested? So what I'll do is start off with a definition of internalized racism. And this comes from a woman that I very recently met who is an anti-racist, uh, anti-racism uh, trainer and a consultant by the name of Donna Bivens. And so here's Donna's definition of internalized racism. Internalized racism is the situation that occurs in a racist system when a racial group oppressed by racism supports the supremacy and dominance of the dominating group by maintaining or participating in the set of attitudes, behaviors, and social structures and ideologies that undergird the dominant power, the dominant uh, group's uh, power. So I know that was a lot and there's a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> kind of packed in there, but really what it boils down to is when you have individuals who internalize the ide ideology, the beliefs, the systems and all of that of racism, even when that racism is directed towards the group that they actually are part of. So then it becomes a little bit of a, a bit of an identity crisis, if you will, because you have a person who identifies as, say, a Black person, but then they take on some of the beliefs of the system that we find, this racialized system that we find ourselves in. So Mavis and Gail, like, how do you, when you hear that definition, how does it resonate for you? I, I wanted to kind of get your uh, input before we jump into a little bit deeper aspect of the conversation. Um, I can comment on that. Um, I, I'm once again embarrassed to say that I was unfamiliar with the concept, but now that I've you know looked into it with all of you, it, it makes sense as to why racism is so intransigent. intransigent. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, people of color uh, or the, the specific racist group have bought in to what the dominant racial group has told them. And that's a pretty simple concept. And, you know, that's very hard to change on both sides. So um, I just uh, find that uh, really surprising. And I don't think a lot of my white friends would, would know about that concept either. Mm -hmm. I just I, I took a small poll and and they thought like me, it's like a, a person of color internalizing their own sense of race. 
-hmm. not what was told to them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or even a white person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a really good distinction. Mm -hmm. Um, And Gail, what did you want to add to that? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's similar to me for if somebody was telling a child for every day for two weeks that they were not good, they were bad, that by the end of those two weeks, that child would internalize that, right? Mm-hmm. The child would start to believe that they're bad, whether they are or not. And I look at racism, that's a little microcosm of it, but, and basically that's simply putting it, what has happened with, um, with people of color and white people who initiated that. It was based on a lie, but it was a, it was um, indoctrinated so much to the point where some people began to internalize it. White people clearly internalized it, hundreds right. of years ago, and even up till this point in time. And even black people have been able to have internalized that. And but I think that's the basis for it. It's if you hear it long enough, you start to wonder, you start to question. Right? Mm-hmm. So a couple of things. Um, another way that people look at internalized racism, you may have heard the phrase colorism. So it's very uh, similar, um, if you will. But Gail, in what you said, I'm really glad that you mentioned children mm-hmm. because that's part of what we're going to talk about is how does this begin to show up in children? Mm-hmm. And we're going to use a film So if you're a member of our audience and you're listening to this, you might be hearing about this film for the very first time, but I would suggest that you go and grab, grab it and watch it because it really does speak to what we're talking about here with this, this concept of internalized uh, racism. So the name of the film is Imitation of Life. It's a 1959 film classic, right? And one of the things that's really important about the film is the time period in which it was released. It was released in 1959. And if you know anything about kind of that 50s going into the 60s, you know that was the, basically the civil rights movement was occurring in that time period. You go back to uh, Emmett Till, and then you go to uh, Rosa Parks and Dr. King and all of these individuals that were really involved, the freedom riders that were really involved in the civil rights movement, all of that was happening in the time that this film was actually released. And the thing that I really like about the film is that it doesn't, like there's nothing in the film that's blatant, right? There's nothing in the film that is blatantly racialized, but there are subtle things that are there. And one of the things that is there, that is probably one of the more dominant themes of the film is this issue of internalized racism. But as it begins in a child, So I'm gonna give you just like the real quick short synopsis of the film. And and it's more focused on the early part of the film. So the film is kind of divided into these two portions, the struggle portion, if you will, and then 10 later, 10 years later, the kind of more prosperous uh, portion of of these individuals' lives. So there's a woman by the name of Miss Laura Meredith. She's a white woman who encounters a woman by the name of Annie Johnson, who is a black woman. They encounter one another at Coney Island in in New York. And they both have a child. They both have a little girl. And Miss Laura, as she is referred to for the most part throughout the film, is the mother of Susie. And Annie is the mother of Sarah Jane. So if you can picture, it's 1959, they're on the beach in Coney Island, these two families, these two single mothers, because both of the mothers are single, and they each have a little girl. So it's a Black family, and it's a white family. And they also are two mothers who are facing problems with rebellious children. One of them the rebellion is actually showing up through the lens of internalized racism. And that would be Sarah Jane, mm-hmm. right? So Mavis and Gail, the, dis- the advantage I would say that we have is that we've seen the film multiple times. <laughs> so yeah. let's just open up the conversation by thinking about how that relationship developed. 
right? So in the beginning of the film, you've got these two women. They don't know each other, but their lives come together. Miss um, Laura loses track of Susie and she's running around the beach trying to figure out where Susie is. And then uh, Annie happened to have found uh, Susie, realized that she was lost, <laughs> told a police officer that she had this lost little girl and they went to a spot to kind of wait for mom to show up. So mom does show up. So now mom and daughter are reunited, but now they've met this black family consisting of Annie and her little girl. So let's talk about the perception of that relationship as that relationship began to unfold. So why don't we start with eeny, meeny, miny, mo? Gail. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Gail. So Gail, if you think about in the early parts of the film, some of the dialogue that was there, um, like while they were at the beach, like the dynamics of the conversation and all of that, what were some of the things that popped out at you um, especially when you, because you have this gift of looking at things through that, um, that mental health and mental wellness kinds of lens. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe that uh, very initial developing relationship between these two women? Well, it's interesting because both women were not able to find work. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference is that, and I think um, Ms. Laurel had been widowed, but, um, but she had a place to live. And whereas Ms. Annie, she didn't. So she and her daughter were homeless at that point in time. Um, but both loved their daughters. Both, you know, were concerned about what was going to happen. But you also get a glimpse of Sarah Jane, who is Annie's, Miss Annie's daughter, um, who is aware of the difference. Now, now Sarah Jane's skin is very light. Um, and what begins to happen, I think, is that, that she starts to say something about how she just wants to go to her own, to a home tonight. Um, and her mother kind of offered to come and help uh, Miss Laura in whatever way she could. And um, Miss Laura had a hard time at first saying yes, but eventually she did say yes. And she welcomed them into, into her home. Um, that's how they get off the beach pretty much. Um, that you know, she was leaving and then she heard Sarah Jane say something mm -hmm. about that she just was crying. She just wanted to be able to go to a home, to a bed tonight. And that's when she, you know, she said, oh, come on home with us. And that's right. how the relationship right. eventually began. Yeah, so that was a very powerful, it was like maybe 10 mm -hmm. seconds, 10 or right. 15 seconds, right. but it was very powerful because you could see what I saw anyway was right. the sense of compassion, compassion that's right. that arose up in Genuine Miss Laura right. for Miss Annie mm -hmm. and, this, and, and her daughter, realizing that they didn't have any place right to go. So Mavis, what do you have to add to that in terms of that developing, that initial developing relationship? Well, I guess first off, I just thought that the relationship was so precious and so like women to be willing to help each other. Mm -hmm. And I love that part. Uh, thinking of the film having been made in 1959, I thought it was very progressive that the white uh, Laura uh, didn't hesitate at all. And I thought that that was, you know, progressive of the directors. It's, it's like you uh, said when we were chatting about this, isn't this what we want in the world? Mm -hmm. That race kind of is just not an issue. Not an issue. Mm -hmm. And then I just, um, I saw the compassion build between the two women. They really needed each other. Um, uh, Laura needed help with Susie while she was going on interviews for acting, you know, she wanted so badly to be a stage actor, and mm -hmm. Annie needed some income. So they were able to really bless each other. And I just love that part of it. I thought it was great. Yeah, absolutely. I completely mm -hmm. agree. Because um, since we started talking about this, this is, had, was the first time I've seen the, the film since like in years, but it was something oh. that I grew up with. Like I grew up watching uh, this film. And because I'm older, number one, because we're having this conversation within the context of uh, where we are today with racism and, you know, racism activation and different things like that. So I saw different elements of that film. And it's really interesting. The only part of it that kind of popped up in the in the earlier part was when uh, Miss Laura realized that Miss Annie was actually 
Sarah Jane's mother because mm. of the difference in their complexion, mm. she made the initial assumption that she was her caregiver mm. or her, like her nanny, right? And, um, but then it, it was quickly corrected and mm -hmm. it was just never a thing after that mm -hmm. with uh, Laura. It just was, it, she just kind of, oh, okay. And, and that sort of thing. And Annie did give her a little bit of an explanation as to what that, how that came to be. Her father, mm -hmm. Sarah Jane's father, apparently was a very fair, very fair skinned man. And, you know, hence the appearance of Sarah Jane. So one other question do you think the way their relationship developed would have been different if they were both white or if they were both black or if the concept of race didn't exist at all that's probably an even more key piece of it if the concept of race did not exist at all what would be your perception, what you just described as your perception of these two women coming together? Would it be different, do you think, if racism didn't exist? If they literally were just two women who happened to be different from one another, but they came together in a relationship? I, I think it would have been different. In what way? And I, I kind of hate to say that, but I think... Um, it's it's so ingrained in our society, racial differences, mm -hmm. that to presume, at least now and since, and for the last four hundred years, that that it doesn't affect the relationship on some level is is just not being realistic. I think they still could have had a very successful, loving and supportive relationship, but um, I think it would have been different maybe fewer questions asked, maybe more understanding, maybe uh, less, um, uh, Annie was really, um, uh, in, I guess to me, she felt subservient, you know, <laughs> like she wanted to help, mm -hmm. but Laura didn't even ask her to do some things. She just kept being so helpful. And I wondered what part race played in that for Annie. Right, but suppose race was not an issue and that just happened to be the kind of person that Annie was, a very hospitable person. But I would say also at the same time, a very humble person. Very because humble. She recognized the situation that she was in. And when she saw the opportunity to kind of, you know, end up with Miss Laura, it wasn't like an opportunistic kind of thing no not at all what do you say Gail no, true. I think it's very genuine I think she she appeared you know, until there was the issue around Sarah Jane and her recollection with the dolls in the story but I'll get back to that but there really wasn't any indication that this was racially motivated or not motivated um because they really both gen were a bit appeared to be in the movie film in the film very genuine and yeah. whether whether Annie was white black or whatever it they were both two women who were in a very similar position in life with a child and a single parent and not having work and not knowing when they were going to get work. Mm -hmm. um, and both were kind of came together to really help and support each other. Um, I, I think because that Annie is so, was a character that was so generous in how she was with everybody. Um, she was very loving, very generous, very mm -hmm. giving. So yes. it was a natural yes. for her to be there to offer those um those ways of being with Ms. Laura right yeah. um was very natural to her but I don't I never got a sense that Ms. Laura took advantage of that even when she yes. was famous yeah. and she was more self-absorbed but she was self-absorbed with everybody right right exactly exactly that's that's yeah. a really really good yeah. point so let's uh shift the conversation a little bit and let's talk about uh Sarah Jane because the racialized elements that show, although there are some like little mm -hmm. subtle things that are sprinkled right. throughout, but the real racializing comes through Sarah Jane and the way that she perceives herself right. as a human being in brown skin, right. moving in this basically white dominated kind of world. Right. And so it's very early on, because I would say uh, the two the two little girls, I believe where I read that Sarah Jane was eight when they met. 
and Susie was about six. So there mm -hmm. is a, a little bit of an age, like two to three year mm -hmm. age difference between mm -hmm. two of them. And Sarah Jane was a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. If you remember, Sarah Jane mm -hmm. was a little bigger. Like mm -hmm. you could tell she was a little bit older. Um, but let's, let's talk about when they got to the house. Like, so they were on the beach. Now they're at the house, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a very uh, unassuming kind Modest. of place. It's just a <laughs> walk up flat. It looks like it has like a living room, a kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, and uh, an area mm -hmm. off from the um, kind of like a pantry. It mm -hmm. kind of reminded me yeah. of like a pantry yeah. off from off from the kitchen so you know the girls are excited now oh we're, we're gonna go home together and so they get to the house and you know they start to get settled in um so there's a scene where Susie so the girls are ready for bed right and they're in Susie's room and like, uh, let me just back up. Cause I never did figure out if Susie and her mom actually shared that room or did mom have like a different room? Like I wasn't mm -hmm. able to figure that part out just the way the difference. Well, that scene. wasn't but, clear in the movie. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't clear. But the two girls happened to be uh, kind of in the bedroom together because mm -hmm. when they came home, mm -hmm. when they were at the door, Susie made a comment. I want to show you my dolls, mm -hmm. right? So they get in the house and, you know, they do whatever they do to get ready for the evening. Um, uh, Miss Laura shows uh, Annie the space that is kind of like a pantry, but there's actually a bed and some other things in that room, right? And so she, you know, says, I'll get the blankets and covers and, and all that for you. And so uh, Miss uh, Annie made it into a room for her and Sarah Jane. Right, so now over into the other room where the where the two little girls are, and sh Susie is sharing her dolls. She has two dolls, and she's sharing her, you know, introducing. She's literally introducing mm -hmm. uh, her to the dolls, mm -hmm. and one doll is white, the other doll is black, mm -hmm. right? And so Susie offers the black doll to Sarah, Sarah Jane. Now, at first glance, you might think, oh, she's offering her the black doll because she's the black girl, right? Mm -hmm. But when Sarah Jane makes it clear to Susie mm -hmm. <clears throat> that she doesn't want the black doll, mm -hmm. it's what Susie said that mm -hmm. kind of clarified that it really wasn't about the color of the doll at all, oh, no. right? So the black doll was actually a new doll. And the way Susie described it, when Sarah Jane said she wanted the white doll, Susie's response was, I can't give, give her, I've had her all my life, she's my friend. And so she looked at Frida, Frida was the doll's name. And she's, I have it here. Frida's my best <laughs> friend. I've had her all my life. That's very different from I'm giving you this doll because you're the black girl. You know, I mean, Susie's like six. So mm -hmm. she loves her dolls, right? She loved her doll and I've had her all my life. That's a very powerful thing for a little kid to say. Right. And and you get the sense that Susie was totally unaware of any of these other dynamics, right? Exactly. So she was uh, exactly. very naive, which was good to see. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad yeah, they wrote it, it that really, way. It was Sarah Jane that you began to see that internalized racism. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. That even by the exactly. age of eight, she was very aware and probably because mostly because of, of the color of her skin. And the fact that Miss Laura. Mm -hmm bought a black, a black doll, doll for right. Susie. That's right. Like I could almost imagine them at right. the doll right. store. In, 19, in the 1950s. In 1950, yeah. Right. Yeah. right, I could imagine them at the doll store. And what if Susie is the one that said, I want this doll? Exactly. Because we don't know that part. Yeah. Right. right, right. So this is what I was saying earlier. If race was not an issue, you would not necessarily make the assumption that 
she mm -hmm. was giving the do black doll away because she was mm -hmm. giving it to the black exactly. girl. Mm -hmm. And so that one little sentence really cleared it up. Yeah. She's my friend and I've had her my whole entire life. And I'm giving you my best new doll. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So Sarah Jane rejects that doll. Right. And so, you know, now it's like, okay, everybody go to their own beds and, and, and go to sleep. And so as Sarah Jane is, she has the doll, but then as she's walking towards the bedroom, she says, to, what did she say to her mother? Do you remember? That Why mother, do we always, always have, have to be in the back room? Why do we always have to be in the back? Oh, I thought that was earlier, but no, anyway, that was when she had the room. doll because they were going into that room to go to sleep. Right, and then uh, she okay. dropped the doll. Out and she, she dropped, dropped the doll. In the kitchen. Uh -huh. Dropped the doll. So okay. that scene in mm -hmm. and of itself is speaking mm -hmm. to the internalized racism oh, yeah. that has begun to emerge in Sarah Jane. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So she goes mm -hmm. in, drops the doll on the floor. Mm -hmm. Then there's the scene where um, the, the girls were uh, playing and Sarah Jane, you know, somebody at school was talking about black people's blood look different from white people's blood. And so Sarah Jane decided that she would like, remember back in the right, day, right. we used to do that thing where we were uh, cut ourselves and say, we're, we're blood sisters. Right. I don't know if y'all ever did that, but I know I did. <laughs> there was something <laughs> similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. Now you are okay, blood sisters. So it was like that. But the point that Sarah Jane was trying to make right. was to look and see if their blood was different because one was black and the other one was white. So right. again, who is introducing this right. idea around race into right. the conversation? Sarah Jane, sure. It is Sarah it's, it's, Jane. It's well, and nice. especially because her mom doesn't speak of it at all in the film. And she's mm -hmm. the most loving mother. And you just wonder, she must have absorbed this, like you were saying, uh, both of you, that kids are very aware and perceptive and they mm -hmm. pick that up early right so by the in spite of everything you look. say to them yeah in their worlds they'll pick that up which is tragic yeah exactly right because she, sarah jane didn't pick up the stuff that her mother uh, about her mother right she was picking up other things from other people from yeah. other people oh, right and it was right. what she was perceiving in society right. white right. is better that's right mm -hmm. That's white what she was picking up. White is mm -hmm. better. So I'm light skinned. I look like I'm white. Mm -hmm. She saw a choice. Yeah. Think about it. She saw mm -hmm. a choice. I can either decide I want to live my life as a black person, but I reject that. Just like I dropped that doll on the floor. Mm -hmm. Or I want to come in the front door. Or I can live my life live as a in the front. Yeah. And come in the front door. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. You can so then uh, we have like uh, one more minute. Um, we always run out of time. But when we come back, um, we're, we're going to talk about uh, Sarah Jane passing at school. Because that's a very, another very powerful mm -hmm. element. And again, this was when Sarah Jane, she's in elementary school, mm -hmm. right? She's still just a little kid. But she's the idea of passing is already in her, right? Yeah. I'd say she was in what, like third grade? That looked like third and grade. She was in a school. white school. She was in a quote white school. They were she all was... white children in that classroom. Mm. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Because when mom came in, when Miss Annie came in and she said, I'm looking for my little girl, isn't this 302 or whatever? Right. Yeah. And the, woman was like, like, I don't, the woman was like, I don't have here. colored children in, right. in my class. And, she, and she's like, oh yeah, yeah. That's my daughter right there, Sarah Jane. And the teacher's like, that's your, that's your daughter? Mm -hmm. So now Sarah Jane has been exposed. Right. And feels humiliated. And she's and feels angry. completely mm -hmm. humiliated and angry about the whole situation. Angry at her mother. Right. And, but, right, yes, because her anger is directed 100% at her mom not society no, it's directly 100 right. at her mom because if you weren't my mother mm -hmm. i would be able to successfully traverse right. the line mm -hmm. into white 
-hmm. and just be white. So I think we should take a break now and then we can come yes. back um, to the conversation. Well, welcome back, everybody. You are listening to Inflection Point Podcast on Transformation Talk Radio. And our topic for today is internalized racism and how it is manifested. So we've been talking about the 1959 uh, classic film, Imitation of Life. So we're going to continue that part of the conversation. So now we're going to talk about uh, Sarah Jane when she was passing at school. So I'll give you a real quick 10 second synopsis of this. So Sarah Jane's in school. It's pouring down raining. She didn't have her galoshes. And so her mom decides to take her galoshes over to the school so that Sarah Jane would have them when she gets out of school and all of that. So she goes into the school, which we're assuming was a predominantly white school or maybe an all white school um, because we only can see that one particular uh, classroom. So she, you know, makes her way to the classroom, knocks on the door, the teacher, you know, says, may I help you? And she says, yes, I'm here to see my daughter. And the teacher's response is, I don't have any colored children in my class. And so Miss Annie starts to look around and she said, oh yeah, 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 that's my daughter right there, Sarah Jane. So now Sarah Jane has been outed because she's been passing at school all the kids thought she was white the teacher thought she was white and here her mom shows up sarah jane flees out of the classroom goes in the coat room gets her 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 coat and hat and whatever and storms out of the school into the pouring rain with her mom chasing in behind her trying to catch up to her and when they finally uh catch up to one another Sarah Jane, um, this is not verbatim, but she says things like, I don't want to be black. Um, I'm and, never going you know, back to that school again. I'm never going back to that school again. And why do you have to be my mother? Right. Mm. Ouch. Exactly. Big ouch. So the problem right. is being exacerbated. Mm -hmm. And I think to a certain extent, the problem is being exacerbated because of where they are now they're in in with this white family so now she's kind of seeing these white dynamics all the time but not like racialized white dynamics but just the whiteness and the you know what she saw is that privilege it's better because they don't I can see that they don't have to deal with this kind of stuff right. it, especially as Laura's career develops and she comes into some money so you know fancy things start to enter the scene exactly through laura's they, work not through annie's work you know but they all right they yeah, enter it for sarah jane too it's not just for susie sarah jane benefits from all that. oh of course yeah, yeah the entire yeah. household everyone does. It. that's that's that's, that's, that's true right that's true. and also annie's presence there mm -hmm. annie was basically the ceo of that household pretty much yeah Right. right. She even, made it work. She made it work. And even mm -hmm. in the beginning when they didn't have any money, she worked everything. She made out, it work. Right. Mailman and, you know, all of these different things because that was who she was. She was like a manager, like a project manager. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. right. right. Because she was able mm -hmm. to step in and she handled everything. So, you know, one could argue, oh, well, she was just being a maid. I don't think she was being a maid. She was uh, being the CEO of a household. It That's all right. depends on how do you shape your perception That's of right. this individual because she right. was definitely an addition and it took a lot of the pressure off of Laura because now right. Laura doesn't have to worry about Susie. Right. Now Annie's Plus, there. Or managing the house. or at all Managing the house, Annie exactly. So she and, was taken care of as if she was a child also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Annie had power. She spoke the truth to Laura, right. which really, yeah. um, I don't know, it just enriched the relationship. Mm -hmm. It would have not felt so good, I don't think, if there was more, wasn't that sort of balance. She, mm -hmm. she gave Laura the what for now and then. She was like her coach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, She's like a coach or a circuit parent. Like a coach, right? Yeah. Right. You know, she yeah. met. 
<laughs> the house right. of, because there's also that scene in there when they moved into the new house and Laura made a statement to mm -hmm. her like if you need more help you can just go hire people right so she's the HR person that's <laughs> right <laughs> and I, that's why I remember when we were talking and we were talking about the fact that there were other people in the household that supported mm -hmm. like the that right. one gentleman that was like the Mm -hmm. I guess like the butler of mm -hmm. the house. And then there were other people when they had parties that, you know, they had staff. Sure, that's right, right. Annie was the one that hired those people. That's and right. Those people into the home. So now she's supporting people in her community. That's right. That's Ms. Exactly Ms. Right. Uh, Laura didn't have, right. she because she didn't have to do it. Hands off, yeah. She didn't have to do it. And by this time, we're in that real self-absorption with, uh, Miss Law, as a result of her career and everything, mm -hmm. but I want to go back to uh, back to Sarah Jane. Let's talk about the Frankie scene. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. I know. That is one of the pivotal right. moments in that film because now she's older, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. older. She's a teenager, and she's you know she's out and about. She goes to the village, and mm -hmm. you know, like she's old enough that she can like go to New York. And, and things right. like that and just be out and about on her own and she finds a boyfriend mm -hmm. but Frankie's a white guy mm -hmm. and so the only time that we get to see Frankie is one of their uh, nights when they had like a little bit of a rendezvous and they were getting together and um, you know uh, Sarah Jane wanted to go down to the river and you could tell by Frankie's body language that something isn't quite right mm -hmm. and it turns out that he had gotten wind of the fact that Sarah Jane was actually black mm -hmm. and you know talking about the mother mm -hmm. you're are you black is your mother a black woman are you black those were the mm -hmm. questions that he was Mm -hmm. asking her so what do you what do you think about that in terms of like you get the impression that they they were like in love mm -hmm. right that they were in love. until he found that out until mm -hmm. he found that out so then it just makes you wonder like what was the foundation of his love really it's absolutely really <laughs> absolutely i don't recall him ever being loving towards her but yeah. um, i might have been projecting <laughs> But you know, when he laid hands on her and beat her, I mean, I was just right. horrified. Yeah. Beat her for who she was. Right. And for lying. And for lying. Right. And you obviously felt betrayed and, and there. Yeah, but still, yeah. fist to cuffs with a woman. Come on. That, that uh, was brutal. Was a, a fair yeah. fight. And, and also, remember, he made the statement that everybody was laughing at him. At him. That oh, he was boy. Right. So that's so in that. Right. In that you can see the intensity of what of how racism was still alive and well, right? Um, and he felt he had a right to physically had a right when he exactly. found out he was black. I mean, it was really exactly because he could have yeah. just walked away, like right. I never want to see her up, right? But he to he your felt point, entitled to be able to do that. I don't matter with impunity, yeah, exactly. Mentality. Yeah. So then that was a very violent end to what was already a distorted relationship. Right. Right? And in that moment, it's when you really begin to see that Sarah Jane associated her blackness with inferiority, right. which is a psychological symptom of some of the stuff that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right, she was yeah. starting to embrace blackness as yeah. inferiority, which is a part of the whole right. racist dialogue about black yes. people mm -hmm. that we're inferior. Mm -hmm. So now she's internalized mm -hmm. that whole idea, well, and she's now her, internalizing it. Yeah, her whole life she was, had been internalizing it. It just was, really came to, mm -hmm. to yeah, you know, he head with Frankie because now it, it feels like to me that that shifted her totally into the default position, which is I'm white. I'm just gonna be white mm -hmm. and totally reject mother. Yeah, right. In in all of that, so it's just 
When, when she went to the clubs and started dancing and doing all the suggestive stuff, that, that was after Frankie or before? That was after. That was be- that was after Frankie because she after. she essentially she, went. Yeah. She had lied to her mother. Yeah, she ran away from home. home. Yeah. Had a job in uh in New York City, which also lets you know that she was older than Susie because Susie was still in high school when all of oh, this. Oh, that's right. That's right. So Sarah J may have been like 18, 19 years old, I think. Yeah, 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 exactly. But yeah. I mean, she lived in Connecticut. So it's easy yeah. to get from Connecticut, to, right Connecticut to, New York. to New York. You just hop on the train and all of that. And so, and, and also in order for her to work in that club, she had to at least be 18. Right. But she moved out. She left. She kind of ran away and wasn't living at their the home that she grew up in. Um, at that point, she was living somewhere. It yeah. was a lie that she was right. working in the library. Right, right. Or because yeah. remember her um, when her mother called the doctor. Uh, the doctor called the library and said, mm-hmm. "Well, she works late hours." Right. Now, what library has late hours? Right. Her poor oh. mom. She really. Oh. really took it she, she believed her she believed her daughter mm-hmm. she always wanted to believe her she always wanted to believe her daughter well and she also believed in her she also saw beyond beyond what their jane was holding attachment to mm. and the negative beliefs that she was attaching to yeah the internalized exactly. racism yeah exactly so one of the things that i mentioned is that sarah jane saw her blackness as inferior mm-hmm. right so that's a reflection of a psychological symptom right. of this whole thing of internalizing racism. Mm-hmm. But the real disease mm-hmm. is the belief in the idea of that's white right. superiority. That's right. That was that's the disease. disease. And it just kind of showed up in Sarah mm-hmm. Jane in, in some of the ways that we've been describing. Right. Well, it was so prevalent in her life that even by the age of eight, when the movie starts, she already had internalized Absolutely. that racism, right? That belief that she was somehow inferior, right? And and she was aware of her skin color. And she was aware, of, even by that age, that mm-hmm. she didn't look black, right? And right. But, yeah. Right. So she decided when she was a little kid, right. I'm just yeah. going to hide. Better if I'm white. Yeah. And I'm just going right. to be why? Because there were multiple times and throughout the film when she said uh, she insistently said, "I'm white, I'm white, white. Right. I'm white." So right. it was like, "I got to get this in here. Right. Okay? Yeah, got to get this in here." Mm-hmm. But blackness was still there. Oh yeah, heritage. Yeah. There. When you think about that uh, final or, or towards the end, that scene where her mom came to see her for the last time. Mm-hmm. Just to say goodbye to her because she knew she was dying. Her mom knew she was dying at that point. But that love for her mom was still yeah. there, but she pushed oh, yeah. underneath mm-hmm. the internalization of this white idea that I want to be white. So That's that true. it got pushed further and further and further down inside of her. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's very tragic when you so sad. So yeah. sad. From yeah. the perspective of a mother, any mother. Yeah. All right. You know, to be rejected by their child. Right. And her fear of her of being found out to be black and not being able to be was so ingrained in her that she literally would abandon the very source of love that she had. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That so, well, let's shift the conversation a little bit and think about this idea of managing the symptoms of racism without treating the disease of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So here's a quote from Lanny Guineer. She's a uh, a former professor. She passed away uh, fairly recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, former uh, p- professor at Harvard Law School. The fact is, and this is um, how this connects to the Brown versus the Board of Education um, decision, the Brown decision, and all of that, because the doll experiment, we were talking about this whole thing with the doll. If you remember how the doll experiment played a role mm-hmm. in that decision and not not necessarily like the role or the prominent role, but it was a part mm-hmm. of that in terms of identifying those psychological symptoms mm-hmm. that are there. In right? very young children. Mm-hmm. Right, but Professor Guineer is arguing that the fact is that 50 years, this is a quote from her, is that 50 years later, many of the social, political and economic problems that the legally trained social engineers thought the court had addressed 
through the Brown decision are still deeply embedded in our society. And then she goes on to talk about this, uh, the Brown contradiction that you got integration, but you didn't get equality. Exactly. You took this step towards integration, but you abandoned the idea of equity. Mm -hmm. And so now all you have is this integration in and school. with the integration, yeah, mm -hmm. and you essentialize mm -hmm. the white children because somehow the black kids have to be in proximity of the white children mm -hmm. in order for this psychological inferiority complex to not be there. Mm -hmm. And that's what Professor Guineer is arguing right. that they, this is her quote, and then I want you all to offer some uh, comments. Uh, it dismantled an old form of whiteness as property while simultaneously permitting it to reemerge in a more subtle form by failing to address mm -hmm. inequity and inequality in resources, power, and ultimately educational opportunity. That's right. That's right. So your thoughts? I, I just wanted to say for our listeners that aren't familiar with Brown, it's uh, Brown v. Board of Education. In 1954, it desegregated schools. And I love what um, Guineer, Dr. Guineer says, a bench-based lawyer crafted social justice mm -hmm. initiative that was ill-equipped to address yes. complex social issues. You know, it reminds me of, of how my great-grandfather had in his diary about, you know, during world uh, the, the Civil War, nobody asked the Black people how to solve this problem. Right. Yeah. And it's still that way. They're, know. you know, not fully a part of the solutions that right. they know. Right. I'm sure that they know what they need. Right. Absolutely. Well, it's, Absolutely. Like, it's like the movie and with Sarah Jane and she's a symbol of that. I mean, she she passed as white. Okay, so it's like that the brown passing, but she was not able to internally change how she believed and how she felt. Mm -hmm. So she still suffered because of that. Right. right. And, the, and quite point. frankly, segregation right. was right. a failure. I've told you my story exactly. is still right. valid. Valley is just as segregated but now as it was before the right. merger. So here's something else that follows of from what you said, maybe it's about the, the lawyer crafting the social justice initiative, mm -hmm. is that integration, this is a really powerful statement, mm -hmm. integration was mistaken for the promised mm -hmm. land. And it was yes. not. Can the promised land exist in the United States that has not come to terms with the way slavery and its racialized compromises shaped our understanding of the nation then and now? Right. It cannot until, not until it comes to the internal belief within everybody shifts and changes into what is true. Yeah. And that the recognition and acceptance that Racism was based on a lie that has been perpetrated and perpetuated for hundreds of years. And until all that is seen clearly and recognized and known, it can't change. Exactly. So I love the way Professor Guineer mm -hmm. shapes that That's conversation right. of symptoms yeah. and disease. Right. The symptoms yeah. That's, a, that's a good distinction. Because we do, in a lot of cases, just address symptoms. Right. Exactly. You know, who is this kid? Not why is this kid uh, disruptive to the class or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. What happened to that child? What's happened what to that, that behavior? Mm -hmm. right? What happened? To the right? Yeah. You got to get to the cause of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So there's lots of information that has been packed in this. So I would recommend anybody who has never oh, seen great movie. the film to go back, watch it, and also think about some of the things that we talked about in this conversation. So Mavis and Gail, your final thoughts on all of this. Gail, do you have your to organize? <laughs> no, but go ahead. I, I, I think I said it. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I said before is what I'd say now. Yeah. Okay, I, I do think that Everyone should watch this film with what they've heard here mm -hmm. and see how they feel mm -hmm. and what they think and what they learned from it. Because I'm pretty sure I watched this movie as a child 
because what I took away from it was how Sarah Jane treated her mother. And my mom drove that, drove that point home. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, you know, my mom used to say a lot, don't, you know, you, you, you I'm, I'm going to die if you treat me bad. <laughs> but so I know I saw it then, but I didn't take in any of what she was suffering from socially. Yeah, right. I didn't, I just didn't, it, I had no frame of reference for it. So Wait, I, I just think it's really great. Yeah. To hear now. Interesting because I mentioned, I grew up watching this film. Yes. Like, yeah. Groups of us yeah. would be together. Oh, imitation of life is on tonight. And we would like get together at somebody's yeah. house and, you know, and watch the film. But we were always rooting for Miss Annie. And just that mm -hmm. was the focal point sure. in the film was okay. Miss Annie and how she was being treated yeah. by her daughter and, and all of that. So we literally have about three minutes left. So um, I just wanna put out a quick call to action for people who are listening. You can go and find out more about my anti-racism work as well as my personal transformation um, work. I, I do coaching and I'm an author and, and all of that. So you can visit the place to soar dot com and you can see basically what it is i'm all about and one of the things that i'm offering that is very closely aligned with this uh work is that uh, later on this in september i'm offering a social impact master class or mastermind um it's an eight-week program where we go through these types of conversations not necessarily these specific topics, I have it pretty much mm -hmm. laid out, but the whole entire idea was for me to create a stepwise process, a stepwise bridge. I call it a bridge crossing for people to really get immersed in conversations like this so that you can walk away with a better understanding of the disease of racism and white supremacy. So the place to soar.com. That will be a great class. It will be, an amazing be a class. class. Yeah, amazing class. So Thank I'll just talk know. about my organization quickly. See two minutes. <laughs> see a better life. Um, it uh, involves work in Rwanda, helping genocide survivors and those affected by the genocide in 1994 to be healthy and uh, go to school. Um, I was just thinking that the work I do there is so similar to the dynamics that we're handling in the United States. It, and, and it's what drew, uh, drew me there in the first place. Why can't we just treat each other lovingly? Mm -hmm. Period. You know, that's it. That's what the work is about. Yeah. Gail, one minute. Uh, and um, I'm a psychotherapist, but I have a nonprofit called OMA uh, Pittsburgh, O-M-A. And we provide um, programs for kids and, and adults, and we provide holistic education. Um, we also do a lot of work with trauma survivors and trauma-informed training. And I just, my wish is that everyone would just take a moment and look within themselves and just yes. be honest with where you are in this process and see what, where you need to start. Because we all are at many different places and it's not about judgment. It's about being open and willing to do that. Yes. Yes. And so I have, I want to just call out this one last thing from uh, Professor Guineer. Mm -hmm. The tactic of desegregation became the ultimate goal rather than the means to secure educational equity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who have been listening, I thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time at Inflection Point Podcast here on Transformation Talk Radio. We are here every first and Wednesday, first and third Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. Eastern time. And we will see you at the next episode. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. The journey towards anti-racism and social change doesn't stop here. Truth, 
reconciliation and healing come from ongoing, open, honest, and deliberate conversations. Continue to dive in and deconstruct your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs as we band together to manifest social change. Tune in to Inflection Point Podcast every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern here on TransformationTalkRadio.com for more conversations about how we can cultivate change from the inside out.